nous y vont. Bien, bonjour, euh, merci d'être venu. Euh, nous avons le plaisir de vous accueillir ici pour un colloque qui est organisé par le COSPAR en coopération avec Universcience sur le sujet qui est indiqué ici au tableau, l'océan et le climat vu de l'espace. Le COSPAR, c'est le Comité mondial de la recherche spatiale, une entité scientifique internationale qui organise des congrès scientifiques tous les deux ans et qui a aussi euh, vocation à transmettre la connaissance scientifique acquise à partir de l'espace auprès du grand public. Nous avons organisé un colloque de ce genre il y a un an et demi euh, à propos de l'astronomie. Et cette fois-ci, nous avons choisi, en liaison avec Universcience qui organise une exposition à laquelle vous pouvez euh, rendre visite euh, sur l'océan, euh, le climat et nous, nous avons choisi de consacrer cette, ce colloque à euh, l'océan et le climat vu de l'espace. Pour euh, organiser ce colloque, nous avons demandé à un comité scientifique international de euh, constituer le programme de conférences auxquelles vous pourrez assister cet après-midi et demain euh, toute la journée. Et euh, à ma gauche, nous avons ben, Jérôme Benveniste de l'Agence spatiale européenne qui a présidé le comité scientifique de notre colloque. Alors je vais lui donner la parole pour introduire les premiers orateurs. Merci, euh, merci. Je dois dire que effectivement, l'Agence spatiale européenne est, est très intéressée par les observations de l'océan et donc en particulier le suivi du climat. Euh, donc c'est un plaisir pour moi d'avoir contribué à, cette, euh, à ce partenariat entre le COSPAR et Universcience. Donc je voudrais euh, ouvrir les travaux avec euh, les premiers orateurs qui vont justement nous apporter une introduction euh, à, cette, à ce colloque. Et donc j'appelle le professeur euh, Giovanni Bignami qui est le président du COSPAR, qui est un astronome qui s'est reconverti euh, à toutes les activités spatiales, mais en particulier euh, très... Euh, intéressé par l'océan et, et le climat. Donc il va ouvrir les travaux, suivi euh, euh, par euh, le, euh, ce Stephen Briggs, qui est de l'Agence spatiale européenne, qui, est, euh, qui, a été, euh, qui a longtemps œuvré pour organiser le, le, le département de, de recherche pour les futurs instruments et l'exploitation des données des satellites en vol, et euh, qui maintenant organise euh, une, un, disons, la coordination et la stratégie. Euh, donc il est euh, avec nous à Paris euh, aujourd'hui. L'Agence spatiale européenne, c'est plusieurs établissements. Euh, moi, je viens de, de Rome spécialement pour cet événement. Et euh, à Rome, nous avons le centre de traitement des, des données de, qui euh, viennent des satellites. Donc, donc Stephen Briggs était euh, responsable d'un des départements d'exploitation. Euh, voilà, donc je laisse la parole au professeur Bignami. Et euh, juste après... Euh, Stephen Briggs prendra la, la parole. Merci. Il ne marche pas, ben si, quand même, ils me l'ont ouvert. Alors, petite surprise, c'est-à-dire, euh, mardi prochain, le 12 euh, avril 2011, ça sera, comme vous tous le, le savez, 50 ans, qu'un certain jeune... Euh, lieutenant de euh, l'armée de l'air euh, soviétique, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, fait la, la première orbite de la Terre. Ça, ça fait un demi-siècle que l'homme euh, a, a volé dans l'espace. C'est quand même quelque chose de très, très significatif. Donc, pour vous, une petite surprise, mais en fait, je l'explique d'abord. Vous savez, tout le monde sait que <rire> Gagarin a démarré sur, le, sur la fusée qui s'appelle Simiorc, le, le, la septième de la, de la série de, de Karaliov, du cosmodrome de Baïkanour. <rire> Très fameux. Bon, et donc, l'inclinaison de son orbite, c'est toujours 51 degrés. C'est la même inclinaison de la Station spatiale internationale. Hein c'est important, c'est un des effets très peu connus de la chute du mur de Berlin, c'est un changement d'inclinaison de l'orbite de la station spatiale, qui était d'abord 28 degrés euh, au temps de Cape Kennedy, et maintenant c'est 51 degrés, parce que le russe doit y arriver de 51 degrés. Donc la station fait la même orbite qu'a fait Gagarin, et donc euh, un, un directeur très doué pour, pour ce genre de, de film, Chris Riley, qui a d'abord gagné un prix important avec In the Shadow of the Moon, a fait un film 
en tournant, en regardant la Terre de la station spatiale sur la même orbite qu'a fait Gagarin, en commençant, en, en, en prenant l'orbite de la station exactement au moment où elle, elle est passée sur Baïkanour. Et ça, c'est le film que je vais vous montrer maintenant les premiers trois minutes, pas, pas beaucoup. C'est très émouvant, je trouve, le début, si j'arrive jamais à le faire démarrer, là. On, on pourrait peut-être éteindre quelques, quelques lumières ici, parce que ça, ça, si on peut... Ça ne marche pas naturellement. Ça a sûrement fait quelques bêtises. On m'avait assuré que c'était trivial. Ah non, ça va, ça va, ça marche. Le son existe. Vous comprenez le russe très bien, naturellement. Дорогие друзья, близкие и незнакомые, соотечественники, люди всех стран и континентов, через несколько минут могучий космический корабль унесет меня в далекие просторы Вселенной. Что можно сказать вам в эти последние минуты перед стартом? Вся моя жизнь кажется мне сейчас одним прекрасным мгновением. Все, что прожито, что сделано прежде, было прожито и сделано ради этой минуты. Film. This is the famous bus containing Tavari Shuri, the base of the Simioka, the Skarilov there. Notice how the strokes. And he cried, Bayeha, let's go. It became world famous. Bayeha, I just said. Notice the shadow of the Simiorca on the ground, the next shot. Voilà, regardez l'ombre, là on voit l'ombre de, de la fusée qui... This is the real thing. Celui-ci, c'est Karaliov. C'est normal. Ils n'étaient pas sûrs de tout, de tout que l'on qu aurait vu hein. encore. Gagarin, on l'avait revu. This is the first view. C'était la première vue de la Terre. Et voilà, maintenant, ça c'est de la Station Spatiale Internationale, de la, la Coupola, cette, cette espèce de bow window faite à, à, à Turin. On voit la Terre, beaucoup mieux bien sûr qu'on la voyait Gagarin, bien sûr, euh, 50 ans après. Et on refait l'orbite. Le film à bord est tourné par Paolo Nespoli, l'astronome italien qui est, qui est maintenant à bord. Et le, le commentaire, c'est l'original. Les images, bien sûr, viennent de la station spatiale, mais le commentaire est fait par Karaliov et Gagarin, qui étaient les seuls qui étaient autorisés à parler dans ce moment. Voilà. Voyons si on arrive à l'arrêter. Parce que... 
Oh. Peut-être ça. Voilà. Ah, je suis arrivé. Eh ben, non. Voilà. C'était simplement pour vous montrer euh, un preview, un film qui, qui je crois, va sortir dans, dans les salles, je crois, assez, assez tôt. Ce n'est pas très drôle comme film parce que ça fait quand même euh, une heure et demie d'image de la Terre sans commentaire, hein, mais sauf les, les, les deux voix de Gagarin et Karaliov. Mais c'est quand même émouvant parce que c'était pour eux la première fois. Et donc, dans le même style, je voulais vous, vous montrer un instant la, plus, ou moins, plus ou moins 50 ans, donc à peu près... Attendez, voilà. À peu près aussi en demi-siècle. Celle-là, c'est, comme beaucoup de vous, de vous savent, la première image de la Terre vue de l'espace, du satellite américain Tyros. Hein et je trouve qu'elle aussi était émouvante et inspirational pour cet après-midi. Et puis après, nous, quand même, nous avons fait un progrès significatif dans ce demi-siècle, un peu comme entre les images de Gagarin et l'image de la station spatiale, grosso modo. Hein. Et, et, et le même, on voit ici, celui-ci, c'est l'intégration originale du satellite Tyros, il y a 50, 51 ans. Et ça, c'est la, la payload d'un satellite d'observation de la Terre moderne. Il me semble que tout ça nous met dans l'esprit correct pour, pour écouter les, les travaux d'aujourd'hui à, à propos de l'observation de la Terre, en particulier de l'océan, euh, parce que c'est quand même... On a eu un demi-siècle de, de temps de, de nous préparer pour ce moment. Hein. Merci et je laisse la parole à, à, à Steve. Je laisse... Merci. Je laisse Merci, Gianni. Non, il ne s'ouvrira pas lui. Vous n'avez pas... Euh... C'est vous ça ou pas Non, non. Ouais, non. Celui-là, il ne va pas s'ouvrir. Il va prendre le Mac. Il va prendre le Mac, oui. Ouais, ouais, je sais, on va prendre le Mac. Après-midi, après euh, mesdames et messieurs, je m'excuse pour euh, le délai. Il est bien 
bien sorti le mur. Logiquement, il devrait le trouver. C'est bon, c'est bon, c'est bon. Il va y aller. Il... 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 Voilà. J'ai essayé de le remouliner, ça marche pas. Non. Mais non, mais c'est la version 2008, vous avez la 2003, c'est tout. Non, mais au-dessus, au oui. euh, on a un autre ordinateur où on, on, on a peut le, le remouliner en version 2003 et ça marchera sans souci. Donc, euh... So, do we have a display ou not Qu'est-ce qu'on fait Can you... <rire> ah, mais, euh, il regarde pas. On n'a rien du tout. Ah bah ben, si, non. On n'a rien. Et sinon, il faudra changer le sous. Ça se trouve que ça ne peut pas. C'est pas normal qu'il me trouve pas. Ça marche pas. Le signal, c'est un autre signal. Ça, c'est un, un autre signal du PC qui vient. Et ce qui est pas normal, c'est que tout à l'heure, il euh, y a une personne qui avait un autre Mac. Où il passait tout à l'heure. Ensuite le fichier, le micro, vous l'avez converti Bon, on va essayer de faire ça. Donc voilà le dos. Take a copy of your slides, mm. just for the posterity. Mm. Oh, this is mine, but it's okay. Yes. Hey. Voilà. <rire> Merci. Donc, voilà. Merci pour l'applause et au revoir. Um, OK, this afternoon, I'd just like to speak for 10 minutes or so about uh, Donc, observations of the Earth from space and of the oceans from space and a few new results from the European Space Agency's program. I'll start with the same slide you just finished with, just to show how well coordinated we are. The slide from the 1st of April 1960 of the very first measurements made from space, the first observations of the Earth from space. But since that time, we've had uh, many more, and uh, if we take as an example, this is a very very familiar slide that shows the evolution of sea level over the last 150 years or so. And if we look towards the last 15 years, then we see here a combination of, uh, of measurements made from a series of different altimeters, which measure very precisely the uh, sea level from space. And several different satellites there put together, but you see there's an overall trend over the last 20 years of around 3 millimeters a year or so. So this is a very easy demonstration, famous demonstration of the benefits of measuring, measuring sea level from space. 
de la mesure des niveaux des échéances à partir de l'espace. Mais euh, en fait, le paysage est plus compliqué parce que ce n'est pas 3 mm partout dans le monde. Et si on regarde le travail qui a été fait récemment par M. Cazeneuve et, et autres, il dit oui, la distribution et l'augmentation des océans. Et c'est un avantage que nous avons en mesurant et en voyant les choses de l'espace. On peut mesurer euh, tous les points sur la Terre. Et vous voyez la, 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 la niveau moyen, euh, jaune, brun, etc., 3 mm, euh, la côte ouest des états unis c'est une valeur négative, donc euh, une diminution. Et alors que dans d'autres zones euh, plus menacées, par exemple l'Asie du Sud-Est, nous avons 3 à 4 fois la valeur euh, moyenne. Donc euh, une déclaration très simple euh, sur l'augmentation moyenne des océans, en fait, cela cache... It's not only in the detection, in the prediction, and in the detection of change that we're able to see, though, but also Donc, perhaps one of the advantages from space is how we might even help to manage the aspects of climate change. And this shows one of the consequences of uh, uh, problems with sea level. If sea level rises, then we can expect many more of the inundations of the type which we saw uh, in the uh, 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 Netherlands, uh, where 70,000 people were moved. Des centaines de milliers de personnes ont dû se déplacer et des barrières ont dû être construites. Vous voyez en ici en blanc pour protéger les pôles d'air. Mais on peut suivre ce qui se passe à partir de l'espace. Vous avez des données satellites qui mesurent très précisément la topographie et les changements. En prenant une série d'images satellites de la région de l'Arc, de, de la Norvège ici, here, vous voyez ici les, or rising, uh, to les the, barrières in relation to the sea level as well. et And uh, what vous we can voyez leur situation et um, uh, uh, leur uh, rising, being deformed substantially, uh, leur, so leur, leur, et, et, voilà, et, 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 et donc cette technique de l'espace uh, mesure non seulement uh, l'impact le, du changement climatique, mais les conséquences également de la variation du niveau des océans. Donc, cela montre bien que euh, l'observation de l'espace peut mesurer les changements, les adaptations, etc. On peut faire beaucoup de and mesures à partir de l'espace en même temps. C'est un autre avantage. Ici, les dernières mesures sur l'événement El Niño en 1998 et l'impact sur l'océan. Généralement, l'eau froide atteint l'ouest de l'océan. Of the ocean, the water falls and then returns across in the subsurface current here. In the case of the El Niño event, everything changes. The entire cycle goes into reverse. And so we see in warm water, temperature is color coded, moving from west to east across the central Pacific. We see the shape of the ocean tells us the strength of the current. I'll say something a bit more about that in a moment. So what we're seeing here is a picture of the entire circulation of the central Pacific being overturned for that two-year period. And this has consequences not only on the circulation, but also on, for example, the fisheries in the western coast of Peru and Chile, which do not have any longer the upwelling cold water which normally takes place there, and which carries with it the nutrients for the fish stocks. And so there's a collapse in the fishing industry as well. So this is an example of how to bring together measurements of the shape of the ocean and the temperature of the ocean. Other measurements which can be made better from space and elsewhere, very famously for climate, is the distribution of ice voilà in, the, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and here you see a long sequence of records of the ice extent in the Arctic made from the National Snow and Ice Data uh, Center. And it shows the gradual decrease de with some variability, but a generally a strong decrease over the last 30 years or so of the extent of summer ice in the uh, Arctic, Arctic uh, Ocean. Dans you see a decrease from around 7.5 million square kilometers down to about 5 million square kilometers in the last 30 years. Uh, uh, so a very rapid decrease. This is accompanied by a thinning carré. of the ice, which is much more difficult to measure. Une and you see here the result from some colleagues uh, from the University of College London using data from the ESA MVSAT satellite, which show a very rapid decrease in the thickness of the ice uh, all the same period. It actually occurs a year later than the, than the minimum of the actual ice extent. And this is the phenomenon Donc, for which uh, the, the satellite Cryosat 
pour lequel le satellite CalSat a été créé spécialement pour suivre cela. Récemment, il y a trois satellites qui ont fonctionné, les premiers de la satellite Explorer construit d'abord le Gauthier mission, le Gravity and Ocean Circulation Experiment, et ce satellite a été lancé deux ans ago pour mesurer la forme, précisément la forme de la Terre, et c'est ce qu'on voit. Not very well, actually. Pas très bien, malheureusement. Voilà, le, le, le rouge apparaît disparaître. Voilà la forme réelle de la Terre, on ne la reconnaît pas, ce n'est pas la, la, la Terre telle qu'on l'aime, la connaît, mais voilà la topographie avec les distorsions. OK, um, if we look at that field of the geoids, so this is the shape of an ideal voilà. Earth. So if we remove all the mountains, and if we think si of this as being an montagne, uh, the Earth covered in ocean elsewhere, then the geoid, the, the mean gravity field of the Earth, is essentially Alors, the shape la the ocean surface would adopt de, if there were no terre, winds, no voilà waves, no currents. And this follows very closely then the, uh, or maps out the et gravity field at the Earth's surface. And the first thing we notice is that it's not flat. Because of the changes in the density of the Earth's core, its mantle, we see changes changes of up to 150 meters in the, for example, in the central Indian Ocean, away from a perfect geometric sphere. And so what we're seeing here is the effect of gravity on the Earth, and if we couple this, what, what interest is this to the oceans? And apart from being a phenomenon to be observed, what consequence does it have for ocean and climate? Well, the important thing that we know is that if we need to understand about the way that the ocean is moving, then we can deduce that from the apparent shape of the ocean at any given time, the apparent ocean surface. And so in order to understand that, we need to remove from that the shape of the surface of the ocean when it was at rest, and that's given by the geoid. So the dynamic topography, in other words, the shape which the ocean adopts because it's moving, is what we observe, which is the mean sea surface, removed and minus what the mean sea surface would be without any motions. So we get the motions of the Earth's surface by subtracting what we see from the perfect surface. And that's why we need to know very precisely what the geoid is. And the results of that are shown here. So this is the mean dynamic topography, so the moving shape of the Earth's ocean surface, taken from a combination of data from different satellites, from Gauthier and from Artemis. And if we then look at the gradients of this, this gives us the global currents on the Earth. So what you see now are the Earth's major surface currents of the oceans observed by two different satellites a different series of satellites, altimetry satellites, which give us the shape of the ocean as we observe it, and the geoid, which comes from Gauthier, which tells us what the shape would be if there were no moon. And so you can see the normal, very famous event here, the Gulf Current, the Gulf Stream Current in the Northwest Atlantic, the Kuroshio Current off the coast of Japan, the Agulhas Current in off the southern tip of South Africa, and the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So these are all constantly flowing very strong uh, currents in the ocean surface, which are extremely important in transporting energy, heat, momentum around the Earth. And if we look in detail at the Gulf Stream, we can see here the topography then deduced from that the current, and if we look at the specific points, these are the previous satellite measurements, and these are the combination of the previous satellite measurements with the in-situ, so these are the best possible measurements uh, to date to use to validate the satellite data. And these here are our new satellite data, data. so we can see how well these two uh, are now correlating with each other, and how well the new measurements from space are able to, uh, to reproduce the detailed measurements for which one has to have oceans, uh, buoys, and ships. Uh, and similarly, uh, if we look also here at the southern tip of South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, we see the combination here. This is the, the detailed measurements from, uh, from buoys, local buoys, and this is the data we get from the so et ici, en haut, les données du satellite. Très bonne corrélation de ces deux types de données. On peut utiliser toutes ces données pour nous donner les mêmes chiffres partout dans le monde. Voilà.
the second satellite, which has recently been launched, will give us two more aspects of the Earth system, which is very important, soil moisture and sea surface salinity. Sea surface salinity has never been measured from space before. And what you see here is a map of the salinity of the ocean uh, measured across the months of August 2010. Uh, on the land here, you see soil moisture map, and in the ocean, you see ocean salinity. If we compare that with measurements made from uh, buoys and ships in situ, this is the satellite data, which is continuous across the globe. And here are the sporadic measurements, which are made by uh, buoys to help validate the data. And you see, even over a period of six months, this is all the data which we can get from buoys. So buoys are extremely important, and uh, Albert Fish will be talking much more about those later. But uh, from satellites, we were able to take these data from the buoys and use them to interpret over whole uh, et utiliser pour interpréter euh, les the données que l'on a sur l'ensemble du globe. Le satellite que j'ai monté, c'est Cryosat 2, ici, et il regarde uh, l'épaisseur de la couche de glace design, au niveau des pôles. Ici, ici here, donc, on voit here. ici les and zones so you see here de glace. Donc, on voit ici les zones de glace en bleu et de l'eau en bleu. Yellow and Glass, green and red, uh, and this <coughs> is the first time that we were able to measure the returns from the ice in such a, a scattered area. Normally, uh, because of the technology, it's impossible to measure uh, when you have a mixture of ice and uh, sea like this. But this is the first time we're able to measure this. Aussi and for the first time, we were able to use une, measurements uh, of the topography, for example, of the uh, ocean, glace, right up almost to the North Pole itself. So here you see Ici, the topography of the topography uh, polar ocean. Uh, <coughs> jusqu'à 68 degrés, plus 68 so degrés. Donc uh, recent satellite, voilà uh, les différents uh, satellites qui viennent juste d'être lancés, uh, lancés pour regarder l'aspect des océans. Il y en a encore à lancer, à lancer, mais cela vous montre l'avantage de combiner différentes mesures en même temps. Autre chose qui n'a pas à voir avec l'océan ou le climat, mais je ne fais pas d'excuses, je ne veux pas m'excuser de vous le montrer ici, ou les observations dans le Vsat. The earthquake off the northeast coast of, of Japan. And this uses a technique of interferometry which allows us to measure these very small changes in the shape of the Earth as we, as we see it, as I mentioned earlier. And you see these stripes here, and each one of those stripes represents a movement of around uh, 3 centimeters in the Earth's surface. And to make it a little bit more intelligible, we can try and bin these up. And what you see now is that each of these color cycles, so if you go from red back to red again, that's a movement of around 50 centimeters in the Earth's surface. So we're able to map movement along the whole of this area down this whole strip, uh, at the same time using this technique. And one could extrapolate from that, and as you see from here, um, this is color coded from 0 to 2.5 meters, the displacement that the Earth's surface uh, caused by the earthquake uh, of Senda. And here you see that this whole region here moved something like 3 to 4 meters to the east. So the whole of Japan, uh, uh, the whole of the eastern coast of Japan, moved around three meters east from its original position. And this is why it has such a So this last example was really just um, Donc, thrown in because we can show you the relevance of these measurements to the recent type of events. But really what I wanted to try and show in 10 minutes is just the importance of observations from space, the different types of observations that can be made, which tell us something about the ocean and the way these were brought together. Et comment on peut combiner ces informations, ces informations qui sont utiles non seulement pour le monde de la science, mais pour l'ensemble de la société dans son ensemble. Merci de votre attention. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Steve Briggs, de nous avoir montré ce que l'on voit depuis l'espace et surtout Giovanni Binami de nous avoir rappelé qu'il y a eu cette vision il y a 50 ans de Gagarin qui nous a montré qu'en fait, il y a une vue imprenable depuis l'espace. Donc, clairement, on observe la planète, que ce soit la Terre et en particulier l'océan, qui est assez vaste et difficile d'accès avec les satellites. Donc, je remercie les orateurs précédents du COSPAR et de l'ESA de nous avoir introduit les sessions. Et maintenant, je vais passer la parole à, euh, au professeur Johannesson, Johnny Johannesson, qui vient de Norvège et qui va présider la session euh, qui commence maintenant.
Donc je lui passe la parole. Et il ne va pas, il ne va pas s'exprimer en norvégien, mais en anglais. Donc vous aurez la traduction en français dans les écouteurs. Merci Johnny. Uh, merci Jérôme. Um, I have to apologize. I will need to continue in English. But it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the next session, which is uh, first addressing the climate and uh, the ocean. And then afterwards, we are going to go into some of the observing systems that is needed in order to monitor this uh, climate change that we all know is occurring. And, um, those two sessions um, will now be starting. So the first present presentation is by Johan Junglaus. He's a senior scientist and research group leader at Max Planck Institute for Metrology in Hamburg, Germany. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Uh, je suis très heureux d'être ici et d'être invité ici pour vous introduire uh, au thème océan et climat en général. Malheureusement, uh, je ne parle le français bien assez pour conduire toute la uh, présentation en français. Et alors, je vais continuer en anglais. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for Bonjour. having me here. Merci and uh, so the presenters this morning had the privilege to mm, get a guided matin, tour through the exhibition chance, uh, uh, upstairs. And I must say it was a really tour, marvelous uh, exhibition. It's very well done. It uh, goes very much into haut. the details, has hand on session. Très, très and if you didn't have a chance to see it, I really recommend. So the only thing I was concerned about was that having seen the exhibition, I might not be able to tell you anything new. Uh, so the task I took over here was to get you a general idea what the ocean's role in climate is. And so we go through these topics. Uh, <coughs> so in a little bit like also the designers of the exhibition had done it, so we want to go first to a general view how we see the ocean and how it uh, shapes the physical geography of the Earth. Uh, an important role there play the large-scale ocean circulation. We have heard the Gulf Stream. Uh, the thermohaline circulation, you find nice examples in the exhibitions on that, how it functions, we will talk about that. The ocean under global warming is of course a hot topic and really a hot topic. Uh, I will not go too much into detail because we will have some topical presentation later in the sessions. Uh, but I would rather go in the last part of my presentation on more the shorter time scale like decadal to multi-decadal and what that means for our ability to say something about not only the next 100 years, but maybe in the next 10 or 15 years. So let's start with a general view. So how we see the ocean. And uh, in his novel Moby Dick, that many of you probably know, uh, it starts with introducing the main character Ishmael. And he goes on telling why people like the ocean. So, so everybody tends to go to the ocean ocean for the walk. Uh, people, mankind, have uh, thriven to go to the ocean to settle there. And then he continues with a uh, emphatic phrase, why did the old Persian hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate god and own brother of Jove? But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans, it's the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and it's a key to it all. So that's, of course, very poetic. Uh, the more sober scientific uh, view of that is probably that it's just the immense heat capacity of the ocean. So three meters of ocean surface uh, can uh, cover the entire, the same amount of uh, heat energy than the entire atmosphere above us. And that makes the maritime climate much more agreeable, much more milder than the continental one. And that's probably the reason why uh, you here in Paris like to escape to the seaside in summer. Uh, <coughs> at the same time that Moby Dick was written, uh, a scientist, Alexander von Humboldt, was uh, writing or had already published his uh, Cosmos, uh, German 
original was coming out in, in 1845, the French translation in uh, 51, and he was already looking back of some decades of research, and he uh, sees his own role quite fundamental uh, here when he is pointing to his 1817 uh, publication de lignes isothermes et de la distribution de la chaleur sur les globes, which is basically uh, a volume of numbers, a lot of tables Donc, with temperature, summer temperature, chiffres, winter temperature, and he été, is quite aware of that he had published something very important savait, there. Uh, it he says that uh, it is a kind of the base of the new science, of the science of climatology, a, but he is also in a typical humble tour way says uh, if really then the physis uh, physicists come up and create a new science, a new physical science, which is then metrology or later also oceanography. Uh, when we read later in the cosmos, uh, Humboldt needs, uh, notes something interesting here, uh, starts with uh, <coughs> that it is quite important that uh, observations, which is basically, of course, European view uh, uh, comparing the temperatures on the same latitude in the British colonies uh, in, in North America and in Europe, you find quite fundamental differences. So the early settlers were complaining that they had to deal with much harsher climate conditions in winter uh, at the same latitude than uh, when they moved here from France. And what he also noticed here again uh, that, that it can only be be a kind of a progress, a scientific progress, if this is really then put into numbers. So <coughs> the numbers and later uh, the graphs that come out of that are indeed these isothermal lines uh, that you see here. Pointer here. Yeah, so on the notion that I mentioned early, uh, earlier that you had uh, comparing temperatures in North America or uh, Europe are quite different. And what you also, also notice at that point was uh, this, this different uh, changes with latitude being the strongest, the higher you come up to the north. So there's something fundamental in uh, the Atlantic uh, apparently. Du nord we see here, that's a modern view from voilà space, uh, uh, temperature observations from space are of course very important. We see again here uh, the line of the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic current Gulf extension Street. into the Arctic, and uh, when you just look at that line, you not only see that uh, <coughs> there are differences between uh, our Western European climate or temperatures on such a November day than we have at the North American Newfoundland. But also different here to the uh, Eastern Pacific, and again, so the Atlantic seems to be somewhat outstanding. So that brings us to really the fundamentals of metrology and oceanography, and it's basically that atmospheric and ocean currents have to deal uh, with the kind of uh, unequal distribution of incoming solar radiation. So if you just uh, imagine that uh, the energy from the sun comes in as short wave radiation and has to be irradiated again from the Earth by long wave radiation, uh, you see that there is an excess of incoming radiation in the low latitude and there's some deficit in uh, the high latitude, so the Earth uh, radiates more to the space uh, than it gets. So Ici, the consequence is that atmosphere and ocean have to transport a lot of heat uh, poleward, and this is just a distribution of the entire ocean and atmosphere heat transport as a function of latitude. You see here uh, <coughs> the numbers here are in peta watt, so that is a, that is a six with 15 zeros attached to it, so quite a tremendous amount of power. So it's not only uh, uh, North-South movement, of Donc, course, and this picture shows you the distribution of uh, atmospheric motion, so the wind systems, uh, and also the drifts and updrafts uh, in the, the vertical motion, uh, the Cyclo uh, the anticyclonic clockwise high uh, pressure systems, the cyclonic low pressure system that we have uh, in, 
in the high latitudes, the westerlies that we uh, get most of our weather west, situations uh, from. <coughs> and uh, coming back to that earlier picture, we see then in the retrospect that Humboldt's dream came through, that the uh, physicists dealt with that, named like Coriolis, who uh, explained they were, took into account the rotation of Coriolis, the Earth, Headley, uh, metrologists like Farrell, they were then among those who really explained what's going on in the atmosphere. Coming back to the ocean, so these are the big ocean current systems, uh, basically the big wind-driven system, for example the westerly in the Southern Ocean tend to general to this Antarctic Circumpolar current. We see the Kuroshio, uh, basically the so-called Jaya system, uh, the subtropical Jayas in the Pacific, uh, in the Atlantic, the subpolar Jayas and at higher latitudes, and of course the famous Gulf Stream. And <coughs> the Gulf Stream, of course, has fascinated mankind for quite a while, so sailors knew about it, and you see here this image. It's basically also, uh, uh, this is from the late 18th century, it was basically also thought as a kind of uh, advice to sailors how to cross the Atlantic. So when Benjamin Franklin was responsible for the postal traffic between America and uh, Europe, continent, they, he recommended uh, uh, that sailors should follow the Gulf Stream and, and associate Captain Folger, the they, he even uh, noticed that it is a good idea to navigate by a thermo thermometer. So you would try to identify where the Gulf Stream is and then get into this current here, which has uh, about a meter per second maximum velocity, so really in terms of how when you think about how much, how fast the ship at that time was, is quite a tremendous advantage, and when you get back, you better uh, travel uh, with the trade winds. And then we find again Alexander von Humboldt as one of the first who noticed something very specific uh, for the uh, ocean current system, and that is that they transport a lot of heat, uh, so the so-called warm currents, they would transport heat to the high latitude, and they are also cold currents like uh, the Humboldt current that would uh, tr uh, transport cold air to lower latitude. And interestingly, uh, you see in this quote also that Humboldt regarded uh, the Gulf Stream as a river in the ocean, and that leads to the well-known prose poem of Captain Maury, who was uh, seen as a founding father of physical oceanography, he collected uh, hundreds and thousands of ship logbooks to uh, come up with a physical oceanography geography of the sea. There's a river in the ocean that banks and its bottom are of cold water, while its currents are of warm, while the Gulf of Mexico is its fountain and its mouth is the Arctic Sea. It's the Gulf Stream, there's in the world no other such magic majestic flow of waters. And our topic interesting here is that he ta is talking about a fountain and a mouth. So he, not, he does not longer regard the, the Gulf Stream as kind of a circum uh, a gyre, but something which has an origin and an exit. And that really makes a good connection then to what's really going on in terms of the heat transport, and that's the so-called thermohaline circulation. You may have seen this image before. Uh, <coughs> this icon of the conveyor was uh, coined by, by Wally Brocker, and you have these warm water masses going into the higher latitudes where they give up heat to the atmosphere at basically in the Nordic seas uh, and the level of sea, and they return uh, as a boundary current in the Atlantic and then are redistributed uh, all over the world and slowly come back uh, to So how is it working? You actually, upstairs you can make a little lab experiment, and it's tempting to see it just as a thermally driven system, so you would have 
cold in the north, uh, uh, warm uh, sunshine at the equator, and you may get something like, like that circulation. But it was as early as 1908 when Johann Sandström made experiments in a little basin like that, and he found out that this does not give us something like the thermohaline circulation. The only thing that how it would work is when you move this heating here to uh, the bottom. So we need to introduce something more, and therefore we come to the thermohaline. So haline stands for the salinity in the system. So we have basically evaporation uh, in the subtropics, and we have precipitation in the mid-latitudes. So that introduces salinity as a major agent of that. And so the combination is more or less like that, that in the Atlantic we have the unique uh, situation that we have both relatively salty and cold waters that make the water sense. See, in addition to that, you need something to stir the system up to give put in energy, and that is mainly done by the winds and also by the tides, and that gives you really uh, that image of the thermohaline circulation with deep water uh, sinking in the north and bottom currents transporting it to the south. Now, uh, if you look into the modern Atlantic, this is a result from an ocean model. We call this uh, overturning circulation, so this is a side view into the Atlantic or average over the Atlantic, south pole to north pole, where you have the sinking water masses here uh, to north and to the south of the Greenland Scotland Ridge. You have also uh, Antarctic bottom water that is originating here at the shelves of Antarctica and making uh, such a counterclockwise rotation. And the strength of that entire system is about uh, 15 to 20, we call it swear drops, it is a million cubic meter per second. But maybe this mass transport is not really the point. Much more important is the heat transport again. And this image uh, shows you the distribution of the ocean part of the heat transport. I mentioned earlier the entire atmosphere ocean uh, heat transport. And we see here in black <coughs> the sum of all, all oceans. And in blue is the Atlantic. And what you see immediately comparing uh, Pacific uh, and Atlantic, uh, uh, this thermohaline circulation system there makes quite a difference. First, it's not symmetric as in the Pacific. Second, it is the biggest part of the ocean heat transport. And third, it goes with this positive sign much more to the north. And that is really what's causing our milder climate. It's not really the Gulf Stream, which is the wind-driven part of the system. It's this heat transport that comes with the ocean circulation and you see here the slope of the heat transport is more or less proportional to the energy that is given to the atmosphere. So in particular here in our latitude uh, the ocean uh, release, uh, releases a lot of heat to the atmosphere and that is carried over to us with the western So in a uh, climate model we can play games and the most like game is uh, to make the thermohaline circulation uh, stop. Des, des jeux, uh, uh, this is a time series of de the de strengths de of the overturning circulation in a model system where we do not disturb it. And then we can put in fresh water here. So if we put to the uh, northern latitudes, we put an amount of uh, uh, 0.1 million cubic so meter per second. That is about an amount uh, of what is not completely fantasy. Uh, it would be amount of fresh water that uh, would be put into the ocean if all Greenland would melt in 600 years. So again, then you see that uh, the overturning circulation uh, goes down. It's not completely breaking down, but it's almost like 50% reduction. And <coughs> in, uh, if we want to connect it with, with the global climate change that we observe, we must say it's not a realistic experiment because we do not put any global warning, warming in, but just the fresh water. So in such a case, really, we see uh, uh, a big cooling, so the missing heat transport that we have, uh, uh, that we're missing now in the ocean, leads to a reduction uh, of 
almost three degrees in the North Atlantic, de, de and that affects uh, at least uh, uh, Northwestern North Europe, uh, Great Britain, Britain quite a lot. So we made uh, a regional modeling study here looking at growing season, and so such an event would have really dramatic consequences. And uh, apparently uh, things like that have happened in the past. Uh, so this is a time series that goes here for uh, 20,000 years and shows us the temperature evolution over Greenland from uh, the uh, remnants of the last ice age going into our stable Holocene period. And we see that the transition zone was kind of intersected by, by a big event, what's called the Younger Dryas, a little bit later than also 8,200 years ago, uh, events uh, of cooling. And uh, they are quite apparently associated with such events of uh, freshwater release to the Atlantic Ocean. And that happened probably at that time because the northern uh, American continent was still partly ice covered and eventually there was a release of these uh, glacier masses into the ocean. So that's a quite different situation than we have probably today where we, if at all, face some small uh, melting from Greenland in uh, comparison to that. You see the magnitude was is quite immense. The 8,200 year event was clearly remarkable. It uh, uh, had impact on the development of agriculture in Western Europe. Uh, and you see that here in relation to climate change that we experienced in the last thousand years, the so-called medieval warm period, the little ice age in the 19th century. So these events were really much bigger. Okay. Uh, yeah, so will it happen again? This question has been risen quite uh, often. So in our climate change simulation, we do not see very much of that. So the main thing that we see oops, is uh, basically this kind of not cooling spot in the Atlantic. So this is really due to, in this simulation, we see about a 30% uh, percent reduction in the overturning circulation. But over uh, the entire Earth, or over, over the continents, it's clear that the global warming wins the game over any cooling in the, uh, in through the ocean circulation. And as you might know, uh, things like that have inspired fantasy of Hollywood directors. Uh, the Day After Tomorrow, famous uh, catastrophe movie, uh, which had the, which really took this idea of the breakdown of the thermal in, into into uh, such a scenario where everything was frozen over within a couple of days and people had to flee the United States to Mexico. Uh, what does science say? It will probably not happen, but and so <coughs> this is something a study that we published some years ago with the results uh, from model studies for the assessment report of the International Panel of Climate Change, where you see. Uh, in black, the undisturbed climate, more or less. In blue, uh, what our model says uh, as a projection for the thermohaline circulation. So you see a roughly a 30% decrease after 100 years, is, uh, the system is kind of recovering. And even if we take into account, in addition to that, uh, the melting of Greenland that most of the models don't take into account, we get a little bit stronger uh, cooling here. Uh, <coughs> but we do not see a total breakdown. Why did I say but? Uh, there are uncertainties, different climate models give different answers to that, uh, and we cannot be sure that it really would not happen, but so the state of the art is that global warming is as global warming the big problem and not the next ice age. Okay, I met uh, talked about that. So we see basically big impacts of the global warming, in particular in high latitude. We see problems of sea ice diminishing, of sea level rise. I will not go into uh, that in detail because we have topical talks here later today and tomorrow uh, on sea ice uh, evolution, on sea level rise tomorrow. And I will also not talk about uh, the other uh, climate problem, uh, the carbon cycle. So as the ocean transport 
heat around it's also taking up uh, a lot of the CO2 that mankind has emitted and it is so uh, distributing it throughout the ocean but it's not sure if that will always go on and in addition to that there's a problem of ocean acidification so that with uh, carbon resolved into the ocean uh, it might uh, cause uh, uh, gives the rise of the, of the acidification, yeah, ocean acidification, sorry. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, I would like to come to another topic. Uh, now we have talked about the big picture, what's going on in time scale of centuries. Now we look rather into decades, and this is an uh, observed record of the uh, sea surface temperature in the uh, ocean in the Atlantic, here distributed from 10 to 20 and 30 to 65 north, and we see quite some variation here uh, in, in, in this. And so this has, it is worth to note that it has about the same, we cannot discriminate in part of these times so here any uh, effect of the global warming. Uh, because this variability patterns here on this decadal time scale has the same magnitude. This is the same just uh, as uh, the mean subtracted, so we see temperature variation of uh, 0.2 degrees and uh, it is, seems to be that these are also related to modulation of the thermohaline circulation, the overturning circulation, this is the work uh, by Jeff Knight, where he shows uh, such a sequence of from warm to cold uh, goes along with either stronger or weaker overturning circulation. And these have effects not only on the North Atlantic SST, but also uh, on the Sahelian rainfall, on India rainfall, also on the uh, hurricanes. So this particular time scale, the decades, uh, is very important. In particular, if you remember the two th mid uh, 2000s hurricane and the discussion that there was, if that is really, is it global warming? Uh, is it just uh, internal variability of the system? Uh, uh, shows us how important that is. And this has opened a kind of new field of climate prediction, the so-called decadal prediction. So we are used in, in a way to these projections that we have for the far future, for 100 years in the future, where we have the greenhouse gases that determine everything. And on the other hand, we have weather forecasts for a couple of days. And so Edward Lorenz was the one who pointed out that there's a fundamental difference between the two. Uh, in the first kind, in the first prediction of the first kind, the weather forecast, the uh, uh, skill comes from our knowledge of the initial conditions of the weather, of the state of the atmosphere, that is quite good because we have all the weather balloons, all the satellites out there. Uh, and that makes, us po uh, makes it possible to uh, make a weather forecast for a week or so. The other so-called prediction of the second kind is a so-called boundary value problem. The boundary value here is, for example, the greenhouse gas concentration. And this determines then the general behavior of the systems. But we cannot make statements about how the weather will be on April 7, 2100. We can only say that it may be overall three degrees warmer or so. And the decadal prediction resides somewhere in between. It depends on the variability on the longer time scale that I've demonstrated with these multi-decadal variation of the overturning circulation. To see the again, here is this uh, influence here, so this is a typical IPCC uh, scenario for the different scenarios, uh, give you a different warming here, you have also some uh, uncertainties from the different models, this is a range of in for individual uh, uh, scenarios here, but if you learn now look into uh, the this is the intermediate uh, future, so the next couple of decades here, uh, we see, first thing is that we see that the scenarios do not differ very much, so regardless what we do, uh, we will face uh, uh, global warming. Even here, if you look in the near term, so this is a case where we would stop all the CO2 emission and keep the CO2 constant. Uh, it's hard to distinguish here in the next on this time scale. Focusing in on that, uh, so if you look at such uh, 
projection prediction runs here. These are for 50 Ici, years, and they are all done with the same model. The only difference is that they are started from uh, different initial conditions in the ocean. So the temperature and salinity fields in the ocean are a bit different. Uh, the state of the thermohaline circulation might be a bit different, and you see that they uh, follow the same trend, but at individual years or decades they uh, follow quite different paths. So you can have like almost two degree difference here between two different what we call ensemble members. Yes, and uh, <coughs> so this is uh, one of the hottest topic in climate research right now, that we try to get better forecast for the near-term future for the next 10 or 20 years by uh, giving this information, the initial state of the ocean to the models, and then we might be able to make assumptions on the state of the thermohaline circulation and then even on related subject, as I mentioned, that could be important, like hurricane activity. Caveat of that, the state of the ocean is not well known, particularly not for the past. This uh, situation is improving, particularly through all these uh, uh, measures that we will hear during the conference from space observation, and in particular to the uh, inner ocean observation system, the Argo system that we will hear about in a minute. So, to summarize, uh, you can just read. Uh, this is from uh, the preface of a book on ocean climate models. A column of ocean water only three meters thick contains as much heat capacity as a full atmospheric column above. Hence, the ocean, which cover roughly 71% of the Earth's surface, provide a large reservoir of heat and other constituents of the Earth's climate system, such as the increasing amounts of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. Through its buffering capabilities and relatively slow time scales, the ocean represents the flywheel of the Earth's climate system, that is, as goes the ocean, so goes the climate system. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Johan. That's three times thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for a question or two. I do not see any raising hands. It's a lot to ask questions, you know. Well, thank you. Can I ask a question in English, or do you prefer in French? Can you answer in French? In French, it's okay. Well, I, I okay. I, I ask a question in English. Uh, I've heard uh, that uh, the Gulf Stream, the Gulf Stream, uh, is said to to disappear in the future. There's a theory about it, and I wanted to know uh, what you think about it. Well, that was basically in, in the presentation. So the idea, it's basically the scenario that, that is associated with this day after tomorrow movie, so that there should, could be. The first thing is that uh, the Earth is warming, and it's warming particularly strongly in the high northern latitude, so that makes the water warm and, and light. And in addition, the hydrological cycle will be intensified, so it will rain more in mid-latitude. And third, uh, the ice sheets can melt. So Greenland could be melting within uh, 500 years or so. And all these components would uh, tend to, to make the Atlantic Ocean surface water uh, lighter, so they would not sink to depth. And that is behind all this idea. As I said, it happened in the past. Uh, our climate models say, yes, we see a reduction, but not really a big shutdown, so not a total shutdown of the uh, circulation. So that, is, that is always associated with somebody talks about Gulf Stream uh, shutdown. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, uh, yeah, I know, a wrong messages make it into the press. So, for example, last winter, uh, it was reported that apparently a Polish scientist had uh, 
said to the media that the Gulf Stream was already vanishing and that has caused uh, the last cold winter over Europe and that is definitely not the case. So we are now able to measure the Gulf Stream. So there are really measurement equipments in there. They have uh, four years of direct measurements of it and there's no sign of any decrease right now. Thank you, Johan. One more question. Euh, euh, le Gulf Stream, par le passé, il s'est, euh, s'est-il déjà arrêté Enfin, j'ai cru entendre dire que le Gulf Stream s'était déjà arrêté dans le passé. Et, euh, est-ce qu'il y a des résultats de ces recherches uh, <coughs> As I got the question was if the Gulf Stream was already uh, decreasing. Is it in the past, yes, yes. In the past, uh, there are traces of that. So it it happened quite frequently uh, uh, in the in the cold climate when we when we did have an ice age, uh, and there. Oh, let me. Slide for that. Okay, that is uh, from a paper by Stefan Ramsdorf, <coughs> and Stefan it appears that Ramsdorf during the ice ages we had a little bit different uh, system in uh, situation in the Atlantic. So we had sea ice all the way to about 60 north, so all the Nordic seas were ice covered, and so we had a different ocean circulation. And it seems that this ocean circulation seemed to be much more vulnerable uh, than the present. And the second is uh, that the interruption that I talked about it that happened in the transient uh, time from the last ice age to now, uh, they happened when we had this this big ice sheets over over Canada that they were rather unstable. So uh, they they were kind of piled up ice and then eventually they would uh, escape to the ocean and and cause uh, such events. So therefore, uh, we have these traces in in the history uh, as well during the ice age as well in the last 20,000 years. Okay, thank you, Johan. I think... be possibilities to come back and ask more questions at the uh, at the panel uh, discussion at the end so now i'd like to introduce uh, the next uh, presentation that's uh, on observer l'océan depuis la surface and it's given by dr albert fischer who is working at unesco the intergovernmental oceanographic commission here in paris Avec vous ici aujourd'hui, je remercie Jean-Louis et, et Jérôme de m'avoir invité à parler avec vous. Euh, en fait, on est dans un colloque qui parle des océans vues de l'espace. Moi, je vais plutôt parler des océans vues des observations in situ, c'est-à-dire pris depuis la surface ou dans, le, dans les océans. Euh, je me présente, je suis Albert Fischer, je suis un spécialiste de programme à la Commission océanographique intergouvernementale de l'UNESCO. Euh, basé ici à Paris. Euh, je suis euh, parisien depuis 10 ans, mais je suis américain à la base. Alors, je fais le pari de parler en français, mais j'espère que vous trouvez qu'il n'y a pas trop de fautes dans ce que je dis. Euh, alors, c- les, pourquoi observer les, les océans depuis la surface Quand on regarde le, la Terre, il y a un écrivain euh, connu, Arthur Clarke, euh, qui disait que la planète Terre devrait être appelée la planète océan. Si on regarde euh, de certains points de vue, ça, ceci est une image qui a été prise par, euh, par euh, le sonde spatial Galileo, qui était en route pour euh, Jupiter, mais qui a passé à la planète Terre en, en route et qui a pris une photo. Là, basée sur le, l'océan Pacifique, on voit un petit bout de l'Amérique du Nord euh, ici, mais on voit essentiellement des nuages et l'océan. Euh, notre planète est, est couverte de 62% de l'océan et euh, notre planète est aussi 50% de la surface de notre planète euh, et de l'océan qui n'appartient à aucun pays, c'est-à-dire que c'est le patrimoine mondial de toute l'humanité. 
si on regarde euh, la profondeur euh, comparée à l'étendue des océans, le, ça, ceci est un coupe euh, près de l'équateur dans le Pacifique. Le Pacifique est le plus large des océans, il fait 11 000 km de large. Et en moyenne, les océans font à peu près 4 km de profondeur. Alors 4 km sur 11 000 km, c'est à peu près le même euh, ratio qu'une qu feuille de papier en termes de la, la, 